My name is Dr. Stephen Ralston, researcher at the Martian University of Crevin. What follows aren't really research notes as much as they are a way of keeping me sane. I need them to truly grasp the magnitude of our discoveries, to keep the order in my mind if you will. For as long as historians could remember, humanity had been looking for their god, but to no avail. Despite several millennium of searching, no deity was ever found. This never really became an issue though until the late 22nd century when we invented the ships needed to explore space outside of our own solar system. The telescopes required a truly peak far into the universe, and technology allowing us to drill deep into the earth. Humanity had turned their eyes to the skies and to the planetary depths to look for answers. Neither heaven nor hell were found, however. Throughout the 23rd century, the disappointment grew and a new church rose. The priest preached about a dead god, believing that ours had somehow died. The religion had its major breakthrough in 2267, and by 2300 they had already converted over a third of the people to this new belief. The necrotic church had much more power than it could ever need, and grew stronger every year. My story begins a good 20 years later, however with me waking up for another day of research. I am to find a definitive answer to the age-old question. Where is God? I refuse to believe he died. 24th of August, 2322 AD. I decided to visit the observatory today. My research had been stale these past few weeks and I felt I could use some new insights. There is only so much one can learn from the history books after all. It always strikes me as odd though. Whenever I talk to the scientists there, how we still have not discovered intelligent life. This, in spite of our technological prowess and our planetary colonizing habits. I feel it would be a solace though. I guess I just don't want to be alone. Probably goes for all of us. To be honest, I would really settle for a few ruins or some scriptures perhaps. Anything but the animalistic species that dominate every habitable planet we've come across. And I digress. There actually was an exciting new discovery which my colleagues told me about. They had discovered a new species of gaver-like creature, albeit with much more flexibility in their claw-like fingers deep in the bush forest of Titan Major. Apparently, the beast had exhibited an irrational fear of the explorers, but that was not the strange part. Although the creatures displayed no exceptional cognitive abilities, they had somehow crafted numerous human-like statues out of thin wood found there. The statues varied greatly in size, from a few inches to close to 10 feet, but apart from gender differences, they were almost exactly the same. I don't know what to make of it. Adam and Eve? Eden? I need some sleep. August 27th, 23-22 AD I received a message from Gerald as I woke up today. He urged to call me back right away, uh, apparently he'd been trying to reach my cell all night. After all these years, he still did not remember that I could not sleep with that thing turned on. Not that it mattered much these past few nights. My research won't let me sleep, and even if I do fall asleep, I have to face the nightmares. I will not be writing those down here, however, as it is best I just forget them. But I digress. Eager to catch up, I called Gerald during breakfast. I did not think too much of his calls during the night back then, for he had done so before. Good morning, Dr. Steyer. I hope you slept well, I began. What? Are you alone? He promptly interrupted me. Yes, yes I am. Good. Well, Dr. Alston, I have some good news for you. He sounded like his old self again. If they have not brainwashed you yet, of course. <laughs> they do try. What news do you have? You should come back to Earth, Stephen. At least the church does not control everything here yet. He explained to me how there was a whole community of like-minded scientists in Tokyo. Some of them atheists. Jared gave me a contact number from one of the Martian members. From what I understand, the scientists are split into two research groups. One branch aimed to find heaven or any son of God in the galaxy. The other held on to belief that God lived inside all of us. It is a shame that I know Jira to be a firm believer of the latter, for it would be a pleasure to work together again. Searching the galaxy sounds like a much more exciting prospect, however. 30th of August, 2322 AD Church confiscates alien artifacts, read the heading on the news website today. Can you believe that those priests actually did that? The first alien craftsmanship we ever have found and they are claiming it, and probably burning it soon too. 
no scientist will be examining those wooden statues. <sighs> On a more cheerful note, I finally met the other scientist Sherrod had told me about. The Marston chapter operated in a state-of-the-art research facility on the crater plains near Crevin. I was able to explore the entirety of it with Chief Researcher Dr. Havard as my guide. He explained to me how they have found several rich benefactors, mainly older religions, to take care of the financial aspects of their research. Most of the funding was used on the observatory, however, and it was magnificent. The telescopes there were unlike any I had ever seen before, in skill and effectivity. Furthermore, Dr. Havard assured me that these were not even the most advanced models they had. In the hallway stood a number of brand new telescopes still wrapped up in their packaging and several parts of a legitimately giant one laid scattered across the floor. I also took the opportunity to ask him about the news I heard today, though I wish I had not. You heard the news today? I asked, about the church's latest confiscation. Yes, I did, he nodded, and I'm afraid there's even more to it than that. Come, walk with me. He led me through a series of highly secured doors into another wing of the research center that I had not yet seen. We entered a large chamber that was stacked to the brink with computers. There were huge touchscreens on both walls and at least a dozen engineers managing the technology. This is what I like to call the war room, Dr. Havert said. And here we gather all information we can on the necrotic church and their activities. Now, about today's news. We have reason to believe that they did not only confiscate the statues, but exterminate the whole species who crafted them as well. What? Who knows what we could have found out by studying those animals? <laughs> These things will just not let me sleep. What could the church be planning? September 10th, 2322 AD The workload of the last few weeks have been enormous, and I have had not much time to write down my thoughts. These are turbulent times, but I will get to that later. Now, since I'm one of the scientists of the facility without extensive prior knowledge of astronomy, Dr. Havard had me mostly doing paperwork. I had to check the planets that had already been discovered by other researchers and to make sure there was nothing special, check reports of the church in the war room and listen to incoming radio signals, or rather, radio static from outer space. Most of it was not that exciting, but it left me plenty of time to talk with other researchers there and focus on my own research. To be fair, it was not so bad at first, but then the church began tracking us down. To make matters worse, we could all follow it in the war room. We could see how the bastards are systematically hunting us down, forcing us to slow our research down and keep a low profile. I had to admit that I was, and still am, frightened. The facility itself is pretty secure, but the risk of getting caught in your own home grows day by day. It feels as if I'm running out of time. With so many of my colleagues being captured, my workload increased immensely, and I even got the help of the telescope. It was then that I was finally initiated into the true progress the facility had made. Something, out there in the galaxy, was moving, and we had no clue what it was. The only proof we had of its existence were our calculations seeing the light had not yet reached its part of the galaxy yet. But whatever it was, it had our whole facility confounded as it did not seem to follow any of the law centuries of scientific progress had come up with. 1. Our object does not move in any logical pattern and appears to be unaffected by gravity. 2. Our object singularly pulls and releases other celestials in its vicinity, without any kind of foreseeable pattern. September 11, 2322 AD Those are not even the most disturbing things about what we found out there. I was not supposed to be clued in about what follows, so perhaps I should not write about it either, but I do not feel like I have a choice anymore. This is too much. <laughs> Here is my attempt at transcribing my conversation with Dr. Havard as he had called me into his office today. Dr. Alston, have a seat. Tea? He greeted me. Well, I do not mean to be blunt, but why did you call me in here? There is just so much work. Ah, uh, yes. You picked up any signals yet? He answered blankly. Well, I began until my eyes met his. Fear? There is a reason I called you in here, Stephen. Our numbers are dwindling, and seeing as how you've helped greatly over the last few weeks, you deserve to know. He sighed and handed me a file. It was about the galactic anomaly we had discovered. The calculations show that our object's gravitational pull is so strong, so very powerful, that it is affecting the orbit of this very planet, as well as every other one, Dr. Havard resumed. What? But... We were dealing with something far beyond what we thought was rationally possible, 
he continued. Beyond what we... Dr. Havard fell silent for a moment, and then looked up and started whispering something of which I could only decipher the word life or alive. I was frightened already. It felt as if I just stood there for hours not knowing what to do. The man just simply stared at the ceiling with that creepy blank stare. I had finally managed to open my mouth as he looked at me again. We found God, he whispered. We did. It not that a bit rash? I answered, shivers running down my spine. No, we did. His eyes were full of steely conviction. And he knows. It's all in the file. How the light has stopped moving toward it ever since we discovered him. We still can't see further into that sector of space than we could four months ago. That can't be right. It is. But there's more. He grabbed the file out of my hand and began flipping through the pages. Here, at exactly 10.06am yesterday, his movement ceased being random. His eyes grew wide. But, he is coming. Our Lord is on his way, and we're not prepared. I must remain calm and focused. I must be calm and focused. I am calm and focused. I am so. Am I? September 12th, 2322 AD As was to be expected, I barely slept last night. In the morning, I could not get up though, and it was not until noon that I finally admitted that I would not find the answers in my own home. So many questions just kept running through my mind as I checked my email during breakfast. Surprisingly, Gerald had sent me a document overnight without any further information. Experiment TZ-23220581 Zing's Notes Executed by Dr. Reynolds, Dr. Steyer, Dr. Calabri, and Dr. Shi. 9.30 a.m. Subject heavily sedated and strapped to the operating table. Subject expects to receive a routine cosmetic procedure in order to ensure the experiment goes on as planned. 9.41 a.m. Subject's cranium carved open and electrodes applied. Shocks are being applied at regular intervals. The subject displays no visible signs of stress or duress and appears to have entered the desired semi-comatose state. 10.18 a.m. Subject grunts and mumbles intelligibly. Intensity of the shocks is being amplified. 10.34 a.m. Subject's rambling loudens and twitching occurs. Shock strength is being ramped up again. Dr. Steyer's protest is denied. 11.06 a.m. Subject suddenly stops moving and goes silent. 11.13 a.m. Subject's heartbeat has dropped noticeably over the past few minutes to an astounding 7 beats per minute. 11.16 a.m. Subject's heartbeat drops below 1 beat per minute. Electrodes being turned even higher, nearing maximum output. 11.18 a.m. Subject starts moving and... Classified. Classified information. I strongly feel that all of the experiment TZ-23220518 points towards us having found a way to classified. Any hypothesis that is supported by all previous TZ line experiments. I was not sure what to make of it. Why did Gerald choose to send me this? I mean, it was interesting to find us to read some of his research, but mostly everything was classified anyway. Not to mention that I had no clue what good such experiments could do in our search for a deity. It took a while for me to be able to leave the comfort of my own home and head to work, at which point I was called by an unknown number. Reluctantly, I answered the call. Hello? Who is this? Steven? Listen up. I don't have much time. Gerald? What? Did you read the file I send you? Yes, but I'll be in Crevin tomorrow night. You need to meet me at the Pelican on Desmond Square by exactly 8pm. Gerald, what the hell are you... 8 p.m., Stephen. You have to be there. Gerald? Silence. What is going on? I mean, any answer will do. Then, when my stress.self finally got to the research facility, there was no one there. Not a single soul. I carefully walked through the empty halls, the lights lit where I went. In my mind, there lurked something behind every corner I took. I checked my cell. No calls, no messages, nothing. Moreover, Dr. Havard would not even answer his. I tried calling my other colleagues, but none of them picked up either. Strangely enough, however, most of the systems were still up and running. All of them were seemingly working toward identifying the entity rushing towards Earth. 
I had trouble understanding the huge chunks of data most of the screens showed without Dr. Hafford though. There was one screen that did catch my eye however. A big one in the center of the room. It showed the entity itself and the insane speed with which it was racing towards us. The thing was hidden in a black cloud and the images were not sharp, but I could see it nonetheless. I could see the dark tendrils protruding from the smoke and the thousands of eyes that it seemed to have. This cannot be God. This moon-shaped monstrosity? It just, it couldn't be. I fear for the others, and I truly do. September 13th, 2322 AD. I stayed home today despite the nightmares I battled all night. At this point, I felt that even the horrific imagery, the paralyzing fear, and even the auditory hallucinations my mind played me with were preferable to the outside world. We were all going to die horribly anyway, I figured. At least I would pass in the comfort of my home, though possibly insane. There is no point in denying it. This morning I have effectively lost it. Things bettered, however, and from 2pm onward only minor hallucinations remained. I kept hearing a faint yelling, for example, and a deep, hushed voice calling out my name. Now, psychiatrists probably would not agree with my analysis, but I blame it on lack of sleep. What was a lot more worrying was I still had not heard anything from the research facility. Oh well, I figured I should try focusing on other things. I switched on the television to distract myself for a while. The channel offered me a dozen different documents to pick from, and I picked one about the growth of London and the first multi-layered metropolis. Anything to just keep my mind occupied. Why was the clock ticking so slowly? The documentary itself was not incredibly interesting. Patrick Sharon tried his best to have an exciting trip to the city, but everything seemed bleak and gloomy, and it had an effect on him as well. His demeanor grew more and more depressed and joyless by the minute, and that was not the only thing that changed, unfortunately. The people he passed no longer went on about their daily lives afterwards. They dropped whatever they were holding and watched with dark, hollowed eyes. It was not too long until Patrick realized this too. It would appear that some of the citizens here have taken a dislike towards foreigners, but I am quite sure the... He paused. Oh, you are here. He spoke as his eyes turned black. Then they all began staring straight at me and more people entered the screen. What the hell is going on? Christ, save me. Save me, Christ. Save all of us. Save us now. Why? I only remember switching off the television and running outside in a moment of primal fear. There is no memory how I got to Desmond Square hours early. 16.37 p.m. But at least the voices are gone. Whatever it is that is haunting me, I am sure that it will not strike me here with all these people around. One of them was Gerald. He was pale and thin, having lost at least 30 pounds, and he looked to be tired beyond belief. You had a feeling you'd be here early. You had always been curious, he said. Come, walk with me. I followed him as he walked towards the park. Did you read the notes I sent you? They are important, but horribly incomplete, as you can probably tell. I want to tell you what we found, because somebody has to know. You're not going to make the research public? I asked him. Ha! <laughs> they would never let us. My entire team is dead, Stephen. The church killed them all. Why? What did you find? They believe we might have found God, Gerald said bitterly. Did... did you? I feared not. But believe me when I say that not a moment goes by that I hope we did. We found something, though. But you just have to take my word as all of our research has been destroyed. He left for a dramatic pause for a while. We have discovered an entity that dwells within all of us. Seeing what we see, hearing what we hear, and ever so slightly controlling what we do. We made first contact with it during the experiments I sent you. It would appear that the constant shocks we applied on our test subject had awakened it. We tried communicating with it, but soon our limbs are no longer our own. We were forced to kill a subject and report all the findings of the necrotic church. All of this without our own consent. He sighed and sat back down with slot shoulders. I don't even know if I chose to tell you this or whether this all fits into this, this thing's master plan. We just sat there for a few minutes until I finally knew what to say. So, does the church think you found God? <laughs> I doubt it. I think they just don't want our research to go public. <laughs> Not even those lunatics could incorporate that into their beliefs. Imagine what it would do to them if God turned out to be alive and almost tangible. Then what can we... 
He grabbed me by my shoulders and stared straight into my eyes as panic reigned in his pupils. You must listen. Do you realize what we're dealing with here? Everything we've ever looked at. Everything we've ever cared about might be a lie. He started talking faster and faster. The reality we breathe, that we think that we live in that is warped, twisted beyond our own comprehension. Jared, listen to me. You need to come. We can't know, Stephen. We can't be sure anymore. What? What can't we know? What lurks beyond the edge of our perception? Jared whispered without an empty look in his eyes. Gerald, snap out of it. Do not trust anything, Stephen. Gerald suddenly took a step back and reached inside his pocket to grab a small handgun. I remember yelling, No! Like they do in the movies. I remember the blood, the gunshot, and me running away. Gerald died today, and I had the feeling that he will not be the last. I don't know what's going on anymore. The hallucinations are gone for now, but I still cannot fully grasp what Jared was telling me. What is even real anymore? Is there really something racing towards Earth? The television shows nothing but static anymore, or am I just imagining things? I feel like a pawn, but whose game are we playing? September 14th, 2322 AD It is becoming increasingly difficult to write in here. Not just because of the fear or the exhaustion that those two burdened me immensely, though, through every hour I fail to catch sleep. Not just because my dreams haunt me and break me through to the horrors that make me watch. It is because I have been crying tonight. Endlessly and almost violently. I witnessed my best friend's death, no, his murder, and I cannot deal. What brought him to do that, and why are these tears not stopping? Are these tears, though, through their constant damaging in my notebook, being used to stop me from writing? Am I becoming as paranoid as Gerald? Do I really believe that there is something controlling us? I am fully aware that these are the words of a shaken, slept-deprived, and traumatized man, but I still cannot bring myself to rip them out of this book. It's 3.15am, and I'm afraid to close my eyes. I must have fallen asleep eventually, because I do partially remember a dream I had. While some parts are vivid, others seem to have been audibly burned out. There is no place that I am safe. My dream began with me standing in the middle of a field surrounded by a tall brick wall with a few meters away from me. It was night, but I could see no stars. I took a few uneasy steps when the wall started shifting. Bricks were continuously being added on top while others were removed just as fast. It was not long before holes began appearing in the wall, though. Places where the bricks would disappear too quickly to be replaced. At first, I could see nothing but darkness to those bricks. But then I began to notice the darkness. There was something out there moving those bricks and destroying my walls. A creature so very dark that it stood out like the brightest star in the otherwise starless night. I felt fear like never before as I was slowly began to define its shape. I felt fear like never before as I slowly began to define its shape. Long, elongated arms made their way through and reached for me before scratching the walls in a frustrated rage as I backed away again and again, my heart pounding in my chest. Suddenly, the limbs were pulling back and for a few heartbeats everything was quiet again. The walls had stopped shifting as a prelude to something much, much worse. Something is out there. Outside of his little bit of shelter was roaring. If I it could even be called that. It placed two hands on the side of one of the walls and started pushing. Long, bone-like fingers grabbed onto the wall, which was now clearly cracking. Its hands pushed the bricks out of its way as if it was just simply specks of dust. It was only then that I felt like I could see its face, greeting me with a terrifying smile that would only befit a psychopath. It opened its mouth to reveal the void within, and I recall thinking that I should recognize that face before it all went black, and I woke up, sweating and out of breath. I had woken up to the laughter of several tall shadow-like figures standing outside my bed. I tried to scream, but they just kept staring. I tried to open my eyes, but nothing was changing. That is when it all became a blur. I remember wondering why I was not moving, but I woke up sitting outside of my balcony. My legs were hurting and the pain quickly urged me to stand up. Somehow I had been sitting in the lotus position, which I had not been able to do since I was 14 or so. Are there even words for my confusion? Am I really still sane? I forced myself to eat something, but I practically had to force the omelet down my throat. The dream still spooked me and I feel like my mind had finally been damaged beyond repair. 
My continuing headache only served to reinforce that statement. It was as if lightning had split my forehead, as if my head was desperately trying to adapt to the newfound madness. Although, one thing was crystal clear. I could not let it consume me. The visions, the dreams, the disappearances, Gerald's suicide. All of it had started with the discovery of Dr. Havert's God. Not to mention the discoveries that Gerald's team had made. Or had they just been crazy talk? I had to reconnect the dots. There had to be some sort of reasoning behind all of this. Reluctantly, I decided to go back to the research facility to gather more information. All the while wondering why I was not more shocked by everything that had just happened. I just felt numb. Arriving at the facility was no boon for my sanity either. Strangely enough, everyone was there again and I was greeted by one very excited researcher. Dr. Stone, according to the name tag. Who talked to me with seemingly limitless respect. She told me that Dr. Haver was looking for me and that other researchers gathered around as she was speaking. They all held their distance and all of them, even ones I had worked with before, stared at me with reverence in their eyes. I felt confused and oddly self-conscious. Hey guys, I hope the research is still going strong, I said, and they seemed satisfied with that. I tried to shake off the weirdness as I made my way to Dr. Havard through the least busy hallways. There were still zero answers. Just two days ago, this place had been abandoned. I shivered as I knocked on Dr. Havard's door. Steve, good to see you. Let me get you some tea. Dr. Havard pulled back a seat for me and immediately put a hot cup of tea in my hands. Perplexed as I was, I could not help but notice that he had put me in his very comfortable desk chair which had been specifically made to ease the strain on his aching back. Meanwhile, Dr. Havard sat on the ordinary office chair, usually reserved for guests. I could see the reference in his eyes as well. But what's going on? It was a question I found myself asking all too much these past few weeks. I had to try and get my answers. Why have I not heard from you? This whole place was abandoned just two days ago. He nodded thoughtfully. Yes, we were receiving our visions too. Our Lord really did make it clear, didn't he? Our Lord? I asked him, shivers running down my spine. Yes, don't you? Ah, forgive me. Our Lord already said that you might still be somewhat shaken and confused from your own revelations. We weren't expecting you until tomorrow. You... You all had visions too. The dreams? Everyone had them? Well, I don't think they were all exactly the same. I saw some very personal things, and I'm sure the others did too. We rarely talk about them, but I feel that they contain the same message overall. He hesitated, and it looked as if he was trying to muster his courage. Was he afraid of me? Would you mind if I asked about your visions? What? My, my apologies, I never meant to offend you, he said quickly. It is just that, that, well, you're his prophet, right? I was dazed. Why me? Why was that thing doing that to all of us? It explained the all they regarded me with, but left me in the dark otherwise. Suddenly, my head seemed to split in half as I heard a deep, loud, echoing voice through it. An imposing voice that could only be described as ancient. You finally come. There were times that I doubted if you'd make it, but you've arrived where you belong. The voice said, and I looked at Dr. Havard, who looked ecstatic. You are to be commended. The other focused at Brunton's assault on you, but you didn't fall, and you didn't break. I was wise to choose you as my prophet. This... this is unreal. I struggle to speak. What... what are you? I am God. Listen and heed my words, prophet. There is a lot to explain. 